Okay, it is the 14th of December 2018 and this is Sally Deakin and I'm talking to Chris Burley for the Kingsland Oral History Project. So, just to start off with, would you like to just tell me a bit about yourself and I'm your life, how you ended up living in Kingsland? Born 1934, spent time in uh, Switzerland prior to war, came back just as war started, shuffled round, my father was killed at Dunkirk, shuffled round the country lots of times, my mother looking after my brothers and I, went to agriculture, went, did my army service, went to agricultural college, came to Hereford as an um, agricultural advisor specialist in pigs, um, settled down, married in Kingsland in 1962. And lived here and lived, ever since? No, we lived, it, lived in Erdsland to start with. Um, but soon realised that the house was too near the road to bring up children, so we moved to Kingsland and oh. brought, it from, brought the house from the Lowe's, who were uncle to Brian Markham. So when you, you say you came to Kingsland in 1962, were you in Erdersland before that? Or no, was that I, when, you came I, to when I came to Hereford, I lodged and then I had a flat in Hereford. So I must have come to Hereford in 59, 60. Okay, and then to Erdersland? And, and then, then to, to Erdersland when we got married. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what's your earliest memory of Kingsland yourself? Of Kingsland? Yeah. Um, having young children, I suppose, getting involved with Kingsland School. Um, I was secretary there for a while and started the um, Parent Teachers Association. There wasn't one then. Mr. Jones was the headmaster. Uh, he lived in the schoolhouse. It was, he, he, didn't, he didn't approve such concept as parents' involvement, so there was no Parent Teachers Association. But um, when he left, we had a man called, I um, can't remember his name now. Anyway, and so we started a parent teacher and we became very active raising money for the children. When was that? Difficult to remember exact date. I suppose Michael Michael was born sixty three, so it must have been late sixties. Mm-hmm. So did you have same a... same time I got involved I was involved with the church and became church warden when Mrs. Shepherd was the um what do you call her? Sextant, I think it was called. I'm not sure that's the right term, but and she ruled the church and looked after it like a rod of iron with her, um, Herbert Thomas, Reverend. And I became people's warden. Um, she told me that I was far too young to do such a job. I took over from. Um, um, Mr. Morgan, um, can't remember his Christian name. Press it Thomas. Okay. Um, being church warden, people's warden, I got involved with the bread and coal charity. This was a charity um, we owned. Um, 
two pieces of land, um, one which had got lost in time, which was somewhere up in Sherald Heath. Uh, the other land was rented by Bert Crump. And so we decided, and we thought we'd better formalize that. And when you were the uh, when we had the coal and bread charity, you had the villagers had to apply for it. And you came to the church vestry on Christmas Eve to claim. And you were given a token. And Mr. Wall used to deliver the bread, the village, from the um, village shop, which is now no longer there. Um, you apply for them, and the coal was then delivered by Bengris and we thought that it was a bit archaic that people did but I've done on two occasions sat there whilst people came to have their coal some ladies used to get very irate when they didn't get coal awarded to them and, and how, how was it awarded? How, how long did, was this charity going and how was it awarded? That's interesting. <coughs> I'm not sure. All I know is that we then we applied to the um, charity commissioners to have it changed into the Relief in Need charity, which now still goes. Do you know, you know about that? No. Um... Well, there were four of us. Um, oh, name gone again. But um, we would, anybody in the village, we used to sit, and if we knew of anybody who was in need of cash, we would be able to um, not necessarily give them money, but... Uh, for instance, was there was one lady who was always, always asking for a little uh, extra time to pay her bill at the post office or the school or at the shop, and I happened to be in there once or twice when she didn't. So suddenly she found that her bill had been paid, and that was the charity that did that. And she she was a lady of I don't think names matter, but of some um, standing in society. And, she had lost everything, had no money. So, but she never told anybody, but we happened to know. And that was the sort of thing the Relief in Need charity did. Okay, so when did that start? Well, roughly. it took, took over, well, I think roughly that must have started again. My memory's not good for dates back there, but um, I go back to 1970s, early 70s, something like that. Okay. Um, Who lived? Oh, name, but husband and wife, chairman, was, was secretary. Can't remember. Um, but the bread and coal charity had been going for that had been years. going for many many years. Steeped in history that was, but and they literally did. They'd be given a, a bag of coal, a hundred weight of coal, and some bread. Okay. And how, where that came from, I don't know. But Herbert Thomas and I sat there, I can remember on two occasions, um, and I was very young and um, new to the village and kept very quiet and just listened and did as I was told. <laughs> they were funny times. I was interested, you said that some ladies got a bit irate if they weren't awarded any. Oh. Who was deciding or how was it decided? It was decided purely by knowledge of the local, the doctor would be on the committee. Um, and I suppose who, who, who made them eligible I think the, the knowledge of the trustees mm -hmm. I mean one lady rang me very very cross because she wasn't getting coal that year and she said but I need my coal I give it to so and so it's their Christmas present every year 
and that made us realize that we had been right in stopping her little allowance. So how many people would be, would benefit from that, do you think, oh, from when you were sitting there in the 10, early 60s? 5, 10, 15, something like that. The rent um, was regular, I never tried to put straight after a while because um, it hadn't been altered. And in fact, the deeds were lost of one particular piece of land and that's history. Mm. But uh, the one other piece of land is still, I think, by the farmer. Okay. Now that's a really interesting memory, this mm. giving out the, the coal and the like. What else do you... You've got lots of little notes down there that I can ask you some Ooh. things. Anything more connected with the church? From the 60s, oh, yes. 70s. The, the, um, we had great problems with the organ, which I expect you know all about. Um, and it was decided to raise money. And I, my memory tells me it was something like 20 something, 22,000, something, quite a, a substantial sum in those days. And um, on on the Progal Church Council, we decided that we'd have, we'd must go ahead have, and ways of raising money. And one of body had an idea which hadn't been done before. We thought at the time, have a flower festival, three day. And have you spoken to Sonia Pridey? Ah, oh, Sarah is going to. She was um, running the corners in at the time, and. Uh, was very forthcoming in doing the catering. And uh, we raised a lot of money at that. And at the same time, Mrs. Pettit, who's a friend of ours, lived in the old rectory. And she, I don't think I'm, I'm sure I'm all right now to say, but at the time she um, offered I knew her well, and she said, Chris, you go ahead and do that organ. I said, we can't, we've got money. So she said, I'll guarantee you. And um, you mustn't tell anybody who's doing this, because at the time she was a, uh, not a worshipper at Kingsland, she worshipped as a Catholic. And one or two, the not conditions, but because they were never written down. But one of the thoughts was that she um, gave the huge picture in the Lady Chapel in the church, which the name escapes from what it's called, and she gave that as memorial too. And her um, lending or promising the money for Paying that, so I went back to church council and said, "We go ahead, got the money." Nobody believed me, but I couldn't say where. But we went ahead and we we raised all the money. And do you remember when this was? Roughly. No. Again, Early I go 60s, back to seventies, seventies. Can I tell you? Any other notes you've made, and then I can ask you some questions. One of the things we did, we, we then tarmacked the new churchyard, but I see that's all grown over with grass now. And we put a new kitchen in, in the church, which was controversial at the time. Um, and Herbert Thomas also tidied the churchyard up. It was a full of. And he, he didn't worry too much in those days for his faculties. He just got on and did it. Um, I think. But going back to the flower festival, um, Mrs. Agnew, um, she was the main 
florist at the time. Not she wasn't a florist, but she was the main organiser for the flowers. And uh, we had a very strong committee. And that's why we were successful, I think. Who was Mrs Agnew? Why did she... she? I can't... She, she came... I, I can't remember. She came from Leominster, I think. But, but she lived where uh, Frank Morgan does now and then um, before that was Richard Hollis who was a great friend of ours. So she was the lady who's living in Fairfield? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, church, I can't think of anything else at the moment. The monument, that was an interesting that was a I we first came to live here. The monument, um, Mrs. Wall, old Mrs. Wall, would sit in there, sitting by the fire, and, and you weren't allowed in unless you had clean clothes on. There was no bar. The beer was came from straight from the barrel. No spirits. And the Coleman from... Bengridge would come up to have their bait there, but they had to sit in the porch because they weren't allowed in or sitting on her seats. Um, but it was... Um, what was it like inside? Oh, I remember big open fire, one room and little porch. It was... It, you, you sat in their living room and drank your beer. But it was... Um, and then after that it was extended and built on um, by name slips me um, but then they started to dig and they started to dig for gold it's the television cameras were here it was a big to do and we, we also had poultry farm poultry down at Lawton Cross where Mona's mother was I came back from there and they wanted as many people as possible in the picture for the television and I declined I said no I've got um, the, the boss not telling them that I was my own but the boss will get cross with me because I was too busy to oh he said here's ten shillings come back and have a pint on me tonight <laughs> No television there everywhere. So who was digging for gold? Tell me about this story. I've never heard this before. Oh, heaven. Um, what, what was going on? Where were they digging? In the barn. Now, you know, I can't remember why. Um, and the farmer... Um, I can't remember who the farmer was, but he... he I, I can't remember the details of it now, except that they were digging for gold at the monument. Oh, that's where they, you'd have to find that out. I will. Great story, though. I like that. Yeah. Mm. There used to be one old boy who'd come up called Ernie Cross from Lower Cross Farm. That would be the uncle of the present farmer there. And he would come up when the monument had been extended extended somewhat. They had a one-armed bandit in there. And he used to sit and tell us stories or tell me about how this road here was not the main road, but the main road was by where the crosses are now, the cross, lower cross farm. Okay. So, and this, when he was a lad, was just a dirt track. This is the main A4110, now, which is outside. Yeah. <coughs> oh, that's very interesting. But that, yeah. But it was the main road when you arrived. 
Oh, yes, the very much so. There were two houses, as there are now. Jim Harding, the local road surveyor, lived next door. And uh, we bought this. Is Jim Harding the man who worked with... He wasn't the one... Cliff. That, he worked with yes. Cliff yeah. at Showers Farm originally and then Shell East. That's right, yeah. That's where the offices were. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And... Uh, Arthur Morgan, heard about him. Oh heavens, he farmed the showers. Um, I have to ask Mona about more about him. Young farmer's days. He married very late in life to Jean, uh, and had a had a a daughter, but he he married very late. Then, very good farmer, he used to, uh, he learned to fly, had an aeroplane too, at Chopton. Yeah. I was really interested in your description of the monuments when you first came here, oh, it what it was like. Can you tell me more about what Kingsley was like when you first came here? 1962 you arrived. I'm sure it must have been very different as a village. Oh, heavens, yes. The doctors, Doc Vaughan was down at, I can't remember the name of his house, but it's a, do you know? The Red House. The Red House, that's right. And if you wanted him, you'd knock on the door and go down the garden path and if he was in the garden he'd wipe his hands off look at you and go on out again it was very relaxed um, there was the Corners Inn had its there were two shops there a bicycle shop and a hairdresser oh, tell me about those I'm not sure mm -hmm. I mean that's my early days There was a, then there was the ten pin bowling app and you know about that. Describe it to me. Did you go there? Oh yes. Ten pin bowling. It was always. It was basic. It was wooden. It was a lot of fun had there. Oh, we even had a. Yes, they'd have. I think they used to put a marquee in the gut in the in, in the um, car park in those days. We had a. Because we started the horse boutique, um, and we used to put a fashion show on there occasionally. Yeah, that's going back a long time. Is that back in the sixties, seventies? Seventies. Hmm. When did you start the horse boutique? Bought that off a lady who started as a hobby. Um, and it was no bigger than kitchen room. Mm -hmm. Kitchen room. Uh, Mona's a, uh, a talented horse lady. I mean, she's ridden at badminton. She's quite horse-minded, and I thought to keep her out of mischief. So I want to ask you about the bowling. You said you used to have, you know, good fun was had bowling down in the bowling alley at the corners. Who used to play there? What was? I mean, was it? Did they have teams or no, was it I don't just think so. have a pint and go and have a you know, bowling alley? Because that's been changed a great deal structurally. Yeah. What did it used to be like inside? Did you used to go to the corners? Mm -hmm. Sta stairways in the middle of the bar where I mean, they hadn't got the dining room or anything now. No. Used to have the um, British Legion suppers there, which I went to. Bert Crump. You know all about him, I bet. No, I don't. Tell me about about those and Bert. Oh, Bert. Was um, been in the war. He uh, 
put his age down a little bit so he could get in there and he went in in with um I think um oh who ran the butcher shop? We had a full time butcher then. We had a you wonder what it was like in those days. We had you know where Kingston stores were? All the ste steps up to it and that was run by Jimmy James and Wing Commander James and his uh, wife. Um, amazing couple. Stocked everything. Mini store, everything. Describe it to me, what was it like? <clears throat> Fully stocked. Top end of food because they like good food. Um, if you went in there on Christmas Eve, you were not allowed to come out till you'd had a nice glass of sherry as well. Um, they had a bakery there. Tom Wall used to, to uh, not Tom, it wasn't Tom Wall, it was, oh, I can't remember his name, Wall, anyway, he would deliver the bread daily. We had two post. We had a um, two deliveries of post a day by bicycle. Um, we had the village was, as I say, it had a full time butcher. It had a bicycle shop, a hairdresser's, post office. It's good. You mentioned the butchers. What was the butchers like? Is that the one at Park House at the end? Yes. That's now a holiday let that they. No, Don't. no. no. Um, okay, why don't you tell me about the butcher's shop? Oh, Walter Mitchell and his father ran it. Father was in the shop, and if if he uh, if there was no customer there, he'd be in his garden, but he'd come to. And Walter would then deliver the meat round. Um, very good meat. We always got ours there. Uh, but uh, they, that was and Walter and his wife, because the um, they still have a relation in the village now, don't they? Yes. Name again. Lost it. I can ask. Mm. I'll find out. Mm. Um, and in fact, Grace Burnham, who we saw last week, because we'd just come back from Surrey, she moved up there to be near her sister. She was... Um, lived in the village in one of those new houses, not far from, but she was a relation to Walter Mitchell. She's now 92. So she lived in the village. Mm. So what was the butcher's shop like inside? Was it Basic. Describe it to me. Imagine you're back in there. Oh. Um, he, they had a big sort of fridge behind him. What do you want today, boy? <laughs> I want a piece of beef or a piece of this. Oh, this do sort of thing. <laughs> He'd chop it up and get very basic. There was much counter to it. There wouldn't be a, 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 it was basic, it was just a country butcher. But I do believe there was another one out at Sherl Heath that, that, um, when we first came to. Oh, was On the that? side of the road. Oh, where was that? I haven't heard of that. Uh, do you know the um, car auction by there? Yeah, it's a long time ago. Well, that's interesting. I didn't mm. know there was another butcher down there. The name's lost. I get to come back. I could... No, that's fine. His son still lives there. It has the dairy herd, the smallest in the country. Okay. No. I can ask Jackie. So you mentioned, uh, what about the angel? 
that direction, be sort of concentrated the on this side of the building. No, the angel, first time I mean, the angel, we Frost brought it, Basil Frost. And he had a manageress called Jane, who now runs the New Inn at Pembridge. And uh, Basil, uh, with a friend of Basil and uh, um, I can't remember his wife's name now but they, they were the first what I call dining pub in the, in the area um, the other one would have been the boot at Alton that always did if you wanted duck you always went there for duck and you'd have half a duck each on your plate but the angel was fine dining very much so. And then at the other end of the village was the... I forgot the name of that pub now. It's right at the far end of the village. The Red Lion? The yes. Red the Lion. one round the corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Past Shoplands, that's yes. our house. Yeah. Tell me what you remember about the Red Lion. Did you go Very there? little. Only went a couple of times. Um, in fact, I don't remember it really at all. Mm -hmm. No, because there were four pubs then, you see. Mm, which is a lot in a... A lot. Mm. Small village. Remember Hamlin Williams? Oh, do you? Tell me your memories of Mr Hamlin Williams. <laughs> um, country squire, irrit irrit irritable, <laughs> cantankerous. <laughs> Where did he live? St Mary's. Okay. And he used to get very cross with um, Carson, whose cattle used to walk through the village and, uh, and a mess on the street. And if any of the children were on the pavement with their bicycles, he told them off. Because so Carson's used to um, have land at either end of the village and therefore they'd drive them in for milking. Up the village. Oh, tell me about that. What, twice a day? Twice a day. Mm. Yes, so John Carson. So they'd go straight down Longford. Which way were they going? Were they? Oh, they'd come down from St Mary's that direction down. Well, they just oh, they, they'd go on the Glebe land up by the church. So, oh, I can't remember where they went, but they'd be all over the place. <laughs> That's an interesting memory there, driving cattle down straight through the village. Yes, but in those days, um, mm. cattle would come in on the, on the train in, in Lemster. Um, or the horses and the... And the um, because the train was still running when we arrived here at, at um, the, the train station. Oh, I'd love to hear about that. Well, I know. I can't remember. I mean, I was used to very early days. And then it closed down, and uh, I actually bought a, a um, stretch of the railway line up the other end of the village because I wanted the sleepers. And uh, I can remember loading all those sleepers onto a traction trailer. Oh, really? Yeah. And what were you using the sleepers for? Oh, I kept pigs here. Okay. I had a thousand pig unit here. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, tell me about that. When did that, when was that running? When I retired from PIDA, Pig Institute Development Authority, as an advisor, we were running the shop and I thought it would be nice to keep some pigs of our own, so we had a pig unit. Started it off with um, bale pig housing and um, sleepers on the floor. That's why I needed those. So when were you running a pig unit here? When, sorry? When? What period were you? Oh, I suppose 70s up to 80s and then the bottom fell out of the pig market. And uh, we had a lot of poultry houses too at the time. Poultry houses back here. 
Oh, behind the lays. The, at the lays. Mm. They went too. Mm-hmm. Was poultry farmed in the same way back in the seventies? No, now? we used to, no. That's interesting. We used to do broiler breeders to start with, when broiler trade started with Sun Valley, and we were at the very early days of that, and we would have arcs on the in the field. Um, ten hens and one cock in each ark, which would be moved as and when, and the eggs would then go to um, the hatchery, which was at, at Chobden and, and the, in um, the old court, and that's how Sun Valley started, that, with people like ourselves growing broiler breeders and the hens um, the, the eggs used to go there for hatching to broilers and that's where I first I think got to know Bert Crump because he used to take my cracked eggs off me to sell round his milk round which he had and I mean, he'd collect them every Thursday night and put me straight and tell me what to do what not to do <laughs> great man was Bert Oh, that's really interesting. So you was, this was a sort of beginning of Sun Valley. Part of it was just here in Kingsland. Moniz was the first secretary for the colonel <coughs> <coughs> at that time. Um, so that was that. What about pig farming in the 60s? That must, because people oh, don't very pigs, different. Right? It must have been very different. Oh, very so different. So what was it like farming pigs here oh, in the 60s? nearly every farm in the county had pigs. Um, we used to rear, breed them and then rear them to eight weeks old and sell them as wieners to a couple of local farmers who would fatten them and send them on. Very different world. Yes, I mean that's very interesting how how things were then mm-hmm. when you were doing mm-hmm. this. What else have I got to tell you? How else was Kingsland different? You've mentioned the sort of the the four pubs and shops that are no longer there. The oh, how that's did it look? Pavements, houses. What was no? I mean. What was the feeling of the place back in oh, 1962? the village. I, I think um, the church was centre of the village. And there wasn't a person in the village I wouldn't have known and talked to, visited. When I was... I was um, uh, what's it called? During the interregnum... Um, I'd had, I had two interregnums while I was church warden. Um, and in those days we had more responsibilities, therefore we would get to know people a little more. Church wardens used to have um, some sort of job to do. And we used to... Cliff was one, he was uh, vicar's warden, and, and I was people's warden. I'm not sure how many years. I so it's some time ago. So what would you do as people's warden? What was the well, whether it's true or false, but we were always led to believe that people's warden was keeper of the village morals. Whether Tell me more. I have no idea. <laughs> but it, I've 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 heard it, and I've never known whether it's true or false. But I used to say, no, I'm keeping your morals. <laughs> But I would know most people in the village, especially during the interregnum, because if anybody came to village, we went and said hello. And it was a. We had an undertaker. I can't remember his name now. He moved Where on. Where was that? Where was the undertaker? If you remember, it's all right. If you don't. Oh, down North Road. Um, the house that's got the workshop on the. On the right, I can't remember what it's named off now. But he and his wife, oh, they were still there. They, because you had the old folks home. The wardens. The wardens. 
and they had their own um, refrigeration department for that's where my mother actually died there and uh, yeah so there was things like the undertaker I mean what was the feel of the place it must have felt very different were the bungalows had they been built in you said they, I think you mentioned to me they were building oh, them no, when you arrived because Jenkins Mrs Jenkins uh, Jen Jenkins farmed that and they farmed the Lucktoe they farmed here and um, the uh, Ductonians, the old Ductonians were there, I mean, they bought this field at auction. Um, when was that, 70s? I don't know, I can't remember. Yes, yeah, sometime. But, but it was all farmland, and, and Jenkins lived down there, and they sold a lot of the land off then for farming. Um, Thelma, Thelma Pudge. Pudge was the daughter, I think. I'm talking to Thelma in the new year, so. So were they still green fields or had all the bungalows, had North Road become a houses or was it still open It was places? becoming houses, I can't remember. I think actually they were built. Okay. Can't remember. This plot here, originally there were to be seven houses here in a sort of curve. They only built two of them. Uh, George Lowe bought one, this one, and then we bought it off that. But he was an uncle to Brian Markham. Hmm. Any other memories of, as you sort of think about how the village looked? The bell, the bell pub had shut, you said. The but what? the bell had, hmm? was not a pub anymore when you arrived. No. No, I can't. Mm -hmm. Any other memories of what mm -hmm. it was like living in the village then, back in 1962? Sounds, you make it sound a long time ago. It is. Well, it's a little while, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a little mm. while. You had a lot to do with the school, you said. Mm -hmm. Were your children young when you arrived? They were young. No, no. Or Michael did you have them when you came here? Had them here. here. Okay. Oh, Michael we had when we arrived. He was born in 62, therefore, and we came in, and I got involved with the school then. Um, I was there when we raised money to spent a lot of time sorting that out. I was, I was chairman of the governors for a while during an interregnum before one of the next rectors came. We were a rector, we were, a, we had our own rector in those days, we own rector. We don't now, I don't think. I'm not sure how it works, but that's in the um, old rectory that, yeah. that the Smiths now live No, in. we were building the... Or were you building the new... New one. one, yeah. Okay. I can't remember who came, Thomas then, another Thomas. No. Um, no. Was there much going on in the village when you arrived? I mean, were there events or anything? happened or I'm sure there were but don't forget we were very busy and very and young with young family and starting business and we did get involved with, with the church a lot mm. Mm. was the church much as it is now or you did mention you put in a new kitchen at some point for it oh no there wasn't that was the you no know, we did we put in the kitchen Oh, I can't remember what date, but no, I can remember that going in. I saw an article about the church bells being restored. I have Was no recollection at all. I think that's fine. I'm just trying to find out the date because I've got a press cutting, a big article, in, um, but there's no date on it, so I'm not quite sure when that was. No, it was before I came. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. 
So what do you think are the biggest changes you've seen in your time in Kingsland since you arrived in 1962? What's the biggest change, do you think, looking back? Expansion. Hmm? The, all the new housing going up. Look what's going on here. Ten houses. The walls are in that Tom Wood uh, from the monument. They applied for planning permission that every other year for the last 20 years, always turned down. And then suddenly it becomes a, a building plot. Nobody understands how. Anyway, that is. So we're going to be into suburbia, aren't we? Sad. But and how's that changed? You said there's been a lot of expansion. You know, lots of new houses. I don't know. I'm divorced from the village now more than ever. I mean, we don't get involved. Sad to say I don't go to church there. I don't go to church. Um, and we don't really get to know anybody in the village. Oh, we know a few people, of course we do. But we're not involved in the village. Too busy, I think. Too old now, anyway. So what's your favourite memory of Kingsland from the past, if you look back? Oh. An era, I suppose, rearing the children and being involved with, with the school, the church. Um... I used to uh, have lots of the boys, I used to employ about 10 of the boy, village boys at one stage because I used to pack up extraordinary things, shavings, which is another, but, and I got to know all the young lads well, you know, so they used to come, now they're all 40, 50 year olds. Anyway, um, Names slip me now, I can't remember all the names. So all the sort of young lads from the village used to come and mm. work up here. Mm. They did. Is there anything else you'd like to say or add to no, any other no, things just, that you haven't mentioned? Not that I can remember. That's great, you've been great. Thank you very much, Chris, for your time.